Let's look at some of what the president had to say that gives people any confidence that this guy, with all due respect, is going to be alive for another five years. Here we go. The issue of immigration and border security, President Biden, a record number of migrants have illegally crossed the southern border on your watch, overwhelming border states and overburdening cities such as New York and Chicago, and in some cases causing real safety and security concerns. Given that, why should voters trust you to solve this crisis? Because we worked very hard to get a bipartisan agreement that not only changed all of that, but made sure that we are in a situation where you had no circumstance where they could come across the border with the number of border police there are now. We significantly increased the number of asylum officers. Significantly, by the way, the Border Patrol endorsed me, endorsed my position. In addition to that, we found ourselves... First of all, that is not true. That is a lie. They did not endorse him. In fact, they actually came out and said, yeah, that's not true. We did not endorse you at all. Uh, here's the problem. And I've been saying this forever when it comes to immigration. I am not anti-immigration, but I am for regulatory immigration, very, very conservatively. And why is that? The reason why we have this immigration crisis is very simple. There is an uprising in the labor movement in this country, demanding a living wage, demanding health care demanding time off, benefits. You know what the powers that be do when that starts to happen? They open up the floodgates at the border and bring in cheap labor. So everyone is screwed in the process. They get richer, the wages go lower, and the country suffers as a result, and more and more people are put into poverty. This is what happens when you deregulate everything. So when the president is out here talking about, we're going to do this bipartisan effort on immigration, it's never going to stop unless we have an infrastructural change in this country. That's the difference. I think hundreds of thousands of immigrants are useful idiots, and they're not, and not idiots in the sense that they don't know any better. They're being brought here to work jobs for pennies on the dollar. If you can't get somebody to work in the Amazon warehouse for the amount of money that they declare is appropriate for you to basically work like a slave, because that's essentially what the, the shipping business has become, because industrialized uh, online business is everything now. So many businesses have taken their, have closed up you know, shop. We don't have interpersonal communication the way that we once did. The shopping malls are nothing like what they once were. So if people are going to work, they're going to work for the wage that they're going to be offered because everything's become monopolized. There's no competition for Amazon. Small business America can't compete with that anymore. I do everything in my power not to shop at Amazon. It's once in a blue moon that I have to get something that I can't get anywhere else. When people want to make a living wage, when they start to unionize like they did in Staten Island, this is what ends up happening. They're not going to give in. They're just going to do what they have to do to maintain the bottom line, to maintain the status quo. That's where the immigration issue comes into play. People can surmise it to be something that it isn't, but that's what it is. We'll continue. I was in a situation where when he was president, he was taking, separating babies from their mothers, putting them in cages, making sure they were, the families were separated. That's not the right way to go. What I've done since I've changed the law, what's happened? I've changed it in a way that now you're in a situation where there are 40% fewer people coming across the border illegally. It's better than when he left office. And I'm going to continue to move until we get the total ban on the, 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 the total initiative relative to what we're going to do with more Border Patrol and more uh, asylum officers. President Trump? Uh, I really don't know what he said at the end of that sentence. I don't think he knows what he said either. Look. It's 
It's got like a, he's channeling a George, totally channeling a bush right there. He's got the bush. Let me, he's looking directly into the sun and Biden's like, it's, it's so bad. It's bad. But man, that ain't, if that ain't a great screenshot, I don't know what is. So I've stayed in my position and I'm sticking to it. Until labor has the uprising that it needs to have in this country, this is going to continue. And that's the reality of, you know, when people want to talk about, well, well, what is it that we're supposed to do here? It's a problem. But that's what Steve mentioned before, which is true. Big problem is that we do not have a labor party. If we had a labor party, this would be, it would be nothing like this. But we don't have one. And that is something that we need. Here we go. You've put forward a, a proposal to resolve this conflict, but so far Hamas has not released the remaining hostages and Israel is continuing its military offensive in Gaza. So what additional leverage will you use to get Hamas and Israel to end the war? You have two minutes. Number one, everyone from the United Nations Security Council straight through to the G7, to the Israelis, and Netanyahu himself have endorsed the plan I put forward, endorsed the plan I put forward, which has three stages to it. The first stage is to treat the hostages for a ceasefire. Second phase is a ceasefire with additional conditions. The third phase is no, the end of the war. The only one who wants the war to continue is Hamas, number one. That's not true. That's another lie. You know, everybody talks about how much Trump lied in the debate, and obviously he can't help himself either. But this is patently false. Israel does not want to end this. Israel wants a ethno state. Netanyahu's government wants an ethno state. So you can say it's Hamas all you want, but that's if if you come to that conclusion, then you're ignoring completely what's going on in the West Bank. And notice how Dana Bash, who is an avowed Zionist, would not mention the West Bank. She mentioned Gaza, which, of course, has been completely obliterated so they can, you know, well, you know, don't have to explain. But the point is, he continues with that talking point. He continues with this talking point of it's just Hamas. Hamas is the problem. And if we just got rid of Hamas, everything will go back to normal. You're not getting rid of Hamas. When you murder, 20,000 innocent children. What do you think is going to happen? How many terror cells are going to pop up as a result? This is what an occupation looks like. And this is what a massacre looks like. We'll continue. The only one standing out. We're still pushing hard from, to get them to accept. In the meantime, what's happened? In Israel, we're finding that the only thing I've denied Israel was 2,000 pound bombs. They don't work very well in populated areas. They kill a lot of innocent people. They don't work very well in populated areas. No, I think they work just fine, just as they're intended to. I don't know how you choose a word like that. They don't work very well. No, actually, they do. That's the point. 2,000 ton bomb. You're giving them weapons like that? This really just comes down to one simple variable. Trump isn't nice, and Joe tries to be nice, but you're still getting the same result. That's the problem. And that's why very few people care when Trump comes out and says, you're just like a Palestinian. You're a total, you're, you're just like, you're, again, and now Palestinian has become a slur. Now you now it's not even about Hamas. Now it really is just cats out of the bag. Now, granted, Trump apparently did take a hundred plus million from is it Miriam Adelson, Sheldon Adelson's uh, widow. Money talks, justice walks. Providing Israel with all the weapons they need and when they need them. And by the way, I'm the guy that organized the world against Iran when they had a full blown intercontinental ballistic ballistic missile attack on Israel. No one was hurt. No one Israeli was accidentally killed, and it just stopped. 
We saved Israel. We are the biggest pro producer of support for Israel of anyone in the world. And so that's, there, there are two different things. Hamas cannot be allowed to be continued. We continue to send our experts and our intelligence people as to how they can get Hamas like we did bin Laden. You don't have to do it. And by the way, they've been greatly weakened, Hamas, greatly weakened, and they should be. They should be. When you talk about Iran and you talk about the, we didn't really attack them and everybody was against them. No, no. The world is against Israel and the United States. It is statistically proven across the board. There's a few nations sprinkled in, including the UK, but even in the UK, they have dissension amongst the ranks as far as where they stand on this issue. And of course, my country of Ireland is firmly behind the Palestinian people. But continuing with this bullshit, it's really tough to take. It is. And I agree. Trump is not going to make it any better. He's just not. Which is all the more reason why finding yourself inspired to try to take things in another direction is how it begins. Your vote has to be earned. It, it can't just be a given. And this is also the reason why it's so significant pertaining to Trump. If the election were held now, Trump is going to win easily. He's now up in New Hampshire. If Trump wins a state like New Hampshire right out of the gate, the election could be a landslide. It could be that bad. And the reason why a landslide, win or lose, it, it again, what you're kind of looking at now is if it's a loss, like how bad of a loss is it? How many seats are going to get flipped in the Senate and in the House? That's the problem. Not having that inspiration on the ground is a big deal. Be eliminated, but you've got to be careful for what using certain weapons among population centers. Just going back to you. Totally, totally got this guy in my, I got him in my mitts. He's totally finished. I, have, I am offended by that, Jules. I happen to like New Hampshire. I don't think that's appropriate. But, you know. Maybe so, Metal, but you can't tell me that that SCOTUS decision isn't a bad one. Because it is. Nevertheless, let's see what else the president has to say. Nobody's coming up this way. You moved it up too soon, Colin. Who? That two trillion dollar tax cut benefited the very wealthy. I, what I'm going to do is fix the tax system. For example, we have a thousand trillionaires in America. I mean, billionaires in America. Okay. First of all, I don't care that he get. That's not. That's not a senile moment where he said trillionaire, billionaire. That's a. That's a slip of the tongue. Whatever. Here's the problem. You have the authority. You have the authority to overturn Trump's tax cuts, and you're not doing it. Just like Obama did not overturn Bush's tax cuts. He made them permanent, and you're going to make them permanent too. So I don't know who you think you're impressing. Unless you're really going to put teeth to something, everything is just one washes hand, one hand, the other washes the other. That's it. I mean, that is it. I live in a world where everything is black and white. There's some shades of gray once in a while. But if you're going to complain about the economic circumstance of this country, particularly when it comes to the ever-growing wealth gap amongst the rich and the poor, and especially the working poor, which used to be the working class and even the middle class, but now it's not there anymore. So the $2 trillion tax cut, which benefited the rich over 80%, if you're not going to overturn that, then you're just blowing smoke. We'll keep going. And what's happening? They're in a situation where they, in fact, pay 8.2% in taxes. If they just paid 24% of 
25 percent, either one of those numbers. They've raised $500 million, billion dollars, I should say, in a 10-year period. We'd be able to right wipe out his debt. We'd be able to help make sure that all those things we need to do, child care, elder care, making sure that we continue to strengthen our health care system, making sure that we're able to make every single solitary person eligible for what I've been able to do with the uh, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look, if we finally beat Medicare. Thank you. We finally beat Medicare. Well, the truth is, in some ways you did by saying that you would veto a Medicare for all bill if it came to your desk. That's not all. The other problem here is simply this. Even if he didn't have what was probably the most senior moment of the night that just happened right now, he doesn't instill any confidence. You cannot look at this man and think that he's capable of running the country for another five years. You just can't. And if you do, you're lying or you're being paid to lie. So it's one or the other. And we know who those people are. I don't have to name them. You know who the people are that are out there making excuses, like David Hunter says, excuse, excuse, excuse. Why exactly are we trying to sell this notion that this guy is capable of running this country? He isn't. Have we reached the point of no return? Is Trump at a point now where he simply can't be beaten and they're just going to take whatever chance they've got by sticking with this guy who could keel over at any, at any moment, at any moment? And when the and, and when the the when the five alarm fire is sounded and people are saying we've got to move on, we've got to go in another direction, and you still insist on sticking with it. Don't blame the voters. People want change. Tr Biden just happens to be at a point where the acceleration of that change is going to get ramped up to an 11. What that's going to mean for RFK, what that's going to mean for Jill Stein, what that's going to mean for Chase Oliver, what that's going to mean for Dr. Cornell West, I don't know. But the closer we get to the election, the more people are going to look around and just say, well, if Biden's going to lose, then I really have nothing to lose. I'm going to vote where I'm how I'm going to vote. Biden has no momentum. He has no boots. It's just, it's kind of inevitable. And the one thing we know that they've been doing constantly, they've been doing this for years. The Democratic establishment only knows fear. That's all they can sell. Because they can't sell you on this idea that they're going, uh, that they're all going to all of the sudden you know, find themselves in a situation where they're going to have like this attack of conscience, if you will. That's not happening. We are where we are. And I'm not saying that people necessarily need to be inspired. You know, I think voting is a civic duty. I think everybody should do it. But I also believe that despair can set in, indifference can set in. And while I agree, Donald, that it is on the voters only to this extent. I hold those that don't vote accountable. Because there's a lot of people who don't vote, but love to complain about how bad things are. If voting didn't change anything, then they wouldn't work so hard to make sure that you couldn't do it. Are the systems rigged? Sure. But you've got two choices. You can either die on your feet or live on your knees. Choose. I won't live on my knees. We'll finish this up. Thank you, President uh, Biden. President Trump? Well, he's right. He did beat Medicare. He beat it to death, and he's destroying Medicare. I mean, he just kind of set him up. He made it too easy. I don't like where we are. And I don't like the fact that we have a president that clearly isn't putting the interests of the country first.
but I wouldn't accuse Trump of putting the interests of the country first either. So here we are. We're stuck. <laughs>